Hey everyone, this video will explain a chapter in our podcast on information retrieval and supervised learning and how we see vector search engines as being the software interface to tie these two different learning task paradigms together. We've seen some really exciting advances lately like OpenAI's WebGPT and DeepMind's retro model that really fuel our excitement about this particular category of combining information retrieval with supervised learning. Following is a clip from the WeV8 podcast. This podcast will be uploaded on the Semi Technology YouTube channel, so please subscribe to see the full video. And if you check out the Semi Technologies YouTube channel right now, there's all sorts of great resources for learning how to use the Weaviate Vector Search Engine and all sorts of different content around these ideas with Vector Search, Neural Search, Neural Symbolic Search, GraphQL, all sorts of exciting ideas. Sometimes it's helpful to think of the end application case when thinking about these learning task constructions for deep learning. So WebGPT and DeepMind's retro model are most commonly evaluated on question answering. This is where it's a very common task as we interact with search engines and all sorts of information uh, transfer between people as we ask questions like, what is the atomic number of oxygen? And then we have to produce a text answer or some kind of answer, say eight. It could be an image. Say you were able to ask the MNIST, uh, some model trained on the MNIST data set, just the natural language question, what is the atomic number of oxygen? Somehow it also connects to Wikipedia and it generates the image eight, whatever is the communication technology. But generally question answering is a very useful way of thinking about the relationship between information retrieval and then supervised learning, particularly uh, classification models where you either classify the exact answer in a, say, uh, 40 dimensional string of discrete tokens and you vectorize that such that you have, you know, indexes along the zero to 40 cross entropy loss between the index in which you predicted the answer in that sequence compared to other strategies like abstractive summarization, where you just kind of generate the answer and then you use the same auto regressive self supervised learning loss to have that kind of backpropagation, differentiable gradient descent optimization. So anyways, this is a quick tour of WebGPT, probably the latest announcement about this. And particularly you see it, how do neural networks work? We ask, her, we ask these kinds of questions and this is really a great way of thinking about what we're talking about with this combination of information retrieval and supervised learning that is really well put together with these WeV8 vector search engine software uh, examples. Personally, one of the, the systems that first caught my attention was CoSearch from Salesforce Research. And this was around, uh, you know, this was during peak kind of COVID-19 hysteria, where uh, we're trying to look for all sort, whatever application deep learning can be used for. And one of the most interesting ones was scientific literature mining. And so there was a lab, I think from Johns Hopkins and other people, they tried to build a, a labeled question answering data set, but they were only able to get like 124 pairs in 23 hours of late of their work quickly, you know, this rapid scramble kind of thing. But so they, they weren't really able to build a big data set that we we're used to using with deep learning. So we're looking for these information retrieval components and CoSearch was this system that said, here's our vector index, here's how it flows into a re-ranker, question answering, abstractive summarization, all these different tasks. And you see how all these different components kind of flow through one another and build this kind mm. of complex system where the modularity of being able to replace these different components is so interesting. And so we've seen also some really exciting trends in information retrieval, like supercharging supervised learning. I think most recently, well, we'll talk about the most recent one, but DeepMind's retro model is an exciting example where they released two language models, this go for 280 billion parameter model. And everyone you know, says 280 billion parameters. Wow. Then they're also saying here's retro. If you add the information retrieval, it's better because it has the, <laughs> it has the context better. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense to have the context. So then kind of coming into the most recent thing, and I think transitions really well to Weaviate and this idea of computer intuition as we talk about how you use these kinds of search engines and then how machines use these search engines. It, to me, it started off, the first paper I came, became familiar with was uh, Facebook AI researchers had a paper titled Internet Augmented Generation, where they're querying mm -hmm. the Bing search API to, to do the information retrieval. So it's not querying a vector search index, it queries the Bing search API. And now today or yesterday, we have uh, OpenAI's WebGPT, where the same idea, you query the Bing search API, but similar to what we're talking about with computer intuition and how you use search engines, they're using reinforcement learning to train the model on how to interpret the results of the Bing search API. So what Weaviate lets us do is we have our neurosymbolic search. And again, coming back to this idea of serendipity, symbolic filters, traversing graphs, the models can learn how they're going to really query this search API. So they can, um, you know, do these things like question answering and then learn how to use their information retrieval component, which is something that I see as being such a powerful uh, supercharger of this. 
Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think so. What's interesting about what you're saying um, right there is that from a from a research perspective, I completely get this, right? Because you try to solve a problem and then there's the Bing API to give you these results. But if we look at one, there was also one of the eye openers that I had that was like, um, let's, if we would have, if, if we would live in a world where all data would be publicly available, <laughs> then there would be no room for existence for something like Reviet because you just go to Bing or to Google and you find anything, right? So the idea that I, that I had was like, so how much data are we talking about actually? So how much data is behind closed doors and how much data is actually publicly available? And, um, you know, Microsoft and Google are quite open about how much data they have in their search engines. And then if you look at estimations about how much data there's, there actually is in the world, you get to a number of like 0.0001% of data that Google actually has indexed. I mean, I might be a, a, a decimal point off there, but the point is it's far less than 1%. So that we thought like, hey, wait a second. So you have the, the data, you have the models, but you also need that search engine if you want to apply this to your own data. So if you're like, if you're a bank, if you're an insurance company, if you have a startup with with uh, which uh, that's generating their own data, and um, and that is what plays so well together with these existing models that are trained on this um, uh, the information that's publicly available. And I think one of the one of the things that I often am in discussion about with with people is the whole concept of fine tuning, right? So and that I say. I, I understand the, acad the academic argument for saying like, in theory, for every case, you need to have a fine tuned um, um, uh, model. I get that argument, but in practice, how people use it, these general purpose models already bring them the results that they need. And, um, and I think that based on these examples that you just gave, uh, Connor, I think we will see more and more of these general purpose models, as I like to call them, being used by more and more people because they are already giving them the results that they need, even if they are trained on stuff or getting the results that are coming from the Bing API or whatever they are coming from, right? Or uh, the common crawl or those kind of things. So um, I think the point that I want to make is that I think like the the... A trend that I think that I see in the usage of these models is that because these models become so much better over time, using them for general purpose use cases becomes easier and easier as well. So you, you need to do less. You, you, don't, you don't need a PhD anymore, basically, to um, use such a model for your, for your business or, or what have you. Thank you so much for listening to this short clip of Bob and I's discussion about all sorts of things related to vector search engines. Please subscribe to Semi Technologies to see the full-length podcast when it's released. Mm -hmm.